This is a new tech production. This is a new tech production. This is a Welcome back to the Oddcast podcast. And straight from the 36 chambers, we're going to go off the course a little bit because we're just going to try to do things in chronological order for the most part. Right. But from straight from 36 chambers, we had a group called Grave Diggers, and they released an album called Six Feet Deep. And the reason why we're going to bring it up is because Rizzo was in it. He was called a Rizzo Rector, but we're just going to briefly talk about it. So straight from this album, they started to do a little bit more hardcore stuff. It was a little bit left field. You know, New York wasn't really known for hardcore. That was like more of like a South uh, thing. So, uh, you know, they started to talk about like, you know, evil spirits and uh, uh, insanity, go crazy in the courtroom and talk about people they killed and stuff. And, you know, Rizzo <laughs> chewing his arm off to escape a, a tabernacle from under the church and shit. Right. So it was it was a little bit different from the regular Wu-Tang shit, but I think it's a nice album. I think it's a classic in my opinion, but it's just something that, you, it's an acquired taste because because of the themes, the horror themes. Not everybody's into that shit. They're gonna call it corny, you know. It's mainly for a Halloween, you know, seasonal album. But I just like I love shit like that, and um, yeah, I just love that album, Six Feet Deep. Right. So um, we were saying uh, off camera. So they dropped Thirty Six Chambers. So instead of uh, so before Method Man, before Takao dropped, um, the Grave Diggers came out, right? Mm -hmm. And so so. RZA just went to a whole new group. A whole new group. He already had a group with nine niggas, so he just, I mean, you know, nothing against the RZA, but he went to a whole new group and did uh, the oh, Grave Diggers. I mean, you know, Grave Diggers was cool. For my taste, it was a little too much. I mean, they, they had songs on there that uh, that I did rock with, but uh, I wasn't like a, um, a huge, huge fan of uh, the Grave Diggers. But um, Method Man to Cal, you know, uh, was the first, um, like Black was saying, it's uh, the first solo album, the first solo debut uh, from the Wu-Tang Clan after they came off that highly acclaimed uh, 36 Chamber album. And um, it did pretty good. It would do platinum, gold status, something like that, That's, I think uh, we were discussing. But um, uh, didn't have uh, a lot of the features that uh, later that, that the later solo albums had. I, I think he was probably done around the same time as 36 Chambers was done, so they were probably still working out their formula. Beats were uh, were very gritty. Very gritty. Because uh, real gritty production on there. If I could just mention something real quick. If you notice on the song Biscuits, the song is very hard to listen to because the beat is so mixed loudly, you can barely hear Method Man's voice. And I don't really know the reason for that, but I just know that Method Man, he, he mentioned that the whole album, he was just dusted off of that angel dust. <laughs> and you know that's why the album sounds the way it does. That's why Method Man he has a different type of uh, his vocal style is a little bit different. He well, the word Takal, Takal is um, it, yeah. I mean Takal is like uh, it's like it's, a slang it's, for it's a lace. It's a, it's a yeah, slang for la a lace blunt. You know, you know what I mean whether whether it be lace with dust or coke or whatever your yeah. your drug of choice is. You know what I mean. But so that's what uh. To cow was, and it did, you know, it kind of sounded like that. It yeah, was yeah. Very, very dusty very feel uh, very to lo it, lo-fi uh, yeah. appeal to it. Um, but uh, RZA uh, said that Method Man was known for the hooks. Method Man had a lot of uh, a lot of singable hooks on his uh, on his album. Just his whole style, you know, um, was different. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, off of uh, off of to cow, bring the pain. Bring the pain was like the uh, was the big single on there? They had the video, of him riding on the bus with the, you know, with the eyepiece and looking um, crazy as a motherfucker. Yeah, that was, but that was his thing, though. You know, Method wanted to uh, kind of deform his face and make himself look, you know, look look ugly and look fucked up. You know what I mean? Uh, for you know, for them, because you know, he also had a. I, the female. Method Man was like the female man. That's why he has. All that's why fuck with fuck with Meth. You yeah, know what because mean? So, because based off the strength of M E T H O D Meth. Um, I think Rizzo was like, you know, we got to put you out here because he was the one getting the most attention. Yeah, he was the rock star. He was the rock star. He was the rock he was, star. Yeah, he was the rock star of the group. And um, I guess it, was, it only made sense for, to put him on first, you know, for record sales and for group publicity. So he had to go first. He also had a song with Mary. Yeah, All, All I, I Need. need. Yeah. Um, Even on the album, he, she's not featured, but that came later. Yeah, the video. it came later. But, the uh, but they had the Marvin Gaye sample in there. Yeah. Um, that video was crazy. He had to iron that video too. Yeah, he did. You know what I mean? He had to half uh, the afro, half braid, half afro. Wu Tang was crazy. They they started a lot of uh, 
a lot of those trends. I mean, because you would see guys uh, walking around the rocking the half uh, half corn roll, half braids. I mean, half afro. It's that green uh, 90s. The, the fangs. Show, Don't even talk about the fangs. Yo, they yeah, used to have the gold fangs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That was something uh, Wu Tang started, man. So yeah, those guys were man. They they was they was doing a lot of setting a lot of trends. Um, they was just doing it, man. Another song off their single was uh, "Release Your Delph." Release. Your Probably one Delph. of the, the bass line on that song. Do, 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 yeah, yo. it's so slick. Man. It kind of grew it, on me. That yeah. one, that one grew on me. I, yeah, because you know the who's singing in that song. You know what her name was. I don't, I don't know. I don't know but she, you know, she had vocals, name. but that was around the time hip hop started to become a little bit more R and B oriented. You know, the mid '90s. That's when a lot of singers started to be on the hooks and stuff. Yeah, that's when it started to go a lot more commercial. Um, for the heads. I, I I like the song, but if we're gonna talk about like pure hip hop, it's like half and half, you know, R and B, half rap. That's just what it was. But for the heads, he had songs like uh, Meth vs Chef. You know what I'm saying? A song where uh, him and uh, Ray featuring Raekwon, where they traded verses back and forth, and like you know, like a battle style. You had um, PLO style, PLO, PLO style, Buddha Bunks with the Al. That was a raw joint. Um, uh, my joint on there was sub uh, crazy. I, yes, I used to love uh, that beat. That beat sounded crazy, yeah, man. Like, even though it's a short song, I hate how. Yeah, it's but short it sounded like uh, like Darth Vader breathing on it or some shit. Like that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? But uh, in songs like Meth vs Chef, that was actually like a real battle, and um, I think RZA, the RZA made them battle on that song, and I think because they used to battle for beats back then. You know, say if, because RZA used to make a lot of beats and these and the rest of the Wu-Tang members used to walk into the room with the beats playing and then Raekwon and Ghost or whoever, they say, yo, I want that. And then RZA be like, nah, battle for it. You know, you got to earn this shit. So that's how most of the production on the albums went. They had to battle for their beats. And then um, most of the time, I think most of the time, I think either Meth won or Raekwon won. <laughs> you know, they got the best beats. So if you if you just listen to Cuban Links, for example, we'll get to that. Right. But it's, you know... All the beats on that shit is fire. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so there you have it for uh, Method Man to Cal. Um, I guess we can go on to, uh, what's the next one after that? Uh, Return to 36 Chambers. Return to the 36 Chambers. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The Old dirty. dirty Bastard. Rest in peace to the Old Dirty Bastard. Rest in peace, Old DB, Old um, Dirt McGirt, man. Baby Jesus. All Big that. Baby Jesus. Yeah, he had all, kind of all kinds of aliases. Man. All kind of names. Now, Old Dirty Bastard was the one uh, he was described um, on the first album as the uh, yeah. as the one that was, there was no father to his style. You know what I'm saying? So uh, he was very unorthodox, man. Old Dirty, uh, his name alone, Old Dirty Bastard. Before him, there was no other name like that. Yeah. Uh, he like, and, and, he I got mean, that he, from a, he got it from a karate movie. One got it from dudes, yeah. The dudes name in the movie were named Old Dirty Bastard. He took the name on, so right it made sense, you know, because um, they're all they're all karate oriented, right? So it made sense. So it made it sense. sense, man. But uh, it was like he was really the old dirty bastard. Yeah. Um, uh, he's also, you know, this this album cover, this cover alone is famous for this, uh, you know, for this food stamp car. And uh, everybody knows the uh, the famous clip of uh, him going to pick up his food stamps uh, with his, you know, baby mom, with his like baby mom, three, and like his kids, kids and, sh <laughs> and, and all in a limousine, mind you. And uh, they pull up to uh, social services and pick up his. Uh, Pick up a welfare check on MTV. You know what I mean. So that alone lets you know the kind of uh, person that that we're dealing with, man. But um, when it came down to his music, man, this guy was like unmatched. He was unmatched. I mean, you know, he didn't. Uh, I don't know if he wrote this stuff down. I doubt if he wrote this stuff down, man. But uh, you know, you know, old dirty bastard was highly. He was that member of the clan that he had that drunken style. Uh, you know, highly under the influence of uh, 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 drugs and alcohol, man. Yes. With, uh, when he was when he was spitting his verses, man. And, and I don't know if I don't know if you guys remember, but if you watched the episode of Young TV Raps when he was on, he was drunk out of his mind. And he was freestyle. Right. That was all authentic. He was actually drunk. I think he just came back from somewhere. He got on TV, fucked up out of his mind, and he just started spitting. And that's why Ed Lover had to jump in and stop him because you know he would just keep going forever if they didn't jump in and stop him. Right. That was right. one of my favorite ODB memos, man. His right. interviews are mad funny too, man. Yeah. Check them out if you haven't said. Check them out, please. If you want a good laugh, just you know, get yourself a beer or something. Get drunk along with them. You have a great time. Yeah, man. Uh, funny story with uh, Old Dirty Bastard, you know. Uh, like I said, y'all, 
Morgan State University. Well, this didn't happen at Morgan State, but this happened at NBC. Uh, I think it was Howard Homecoming or something was going on at Howard, you know what I mean? So uh, we're in this club, you know, me and, me and my dudes, and um, we chilling and, you know, we seeing, uh, I believe Smith & Wesson or somebody was performing. But anyway, uh, you know, I see a guy walking around with a, you know, with a big army jacket on, and he had, you know, of course, the, you know, half braids, half afro, had a, had a brown bag in his hand. And he walking around the party, and I was like, yo, psh, that's ODB. So it's like he walking around the party, and everybody knew who he was, but nobody was like, you know, tripping or nothing like that. Like, oh my God, Old Dirty. So anyway, next thing you know, Old Dirty finds the way he's on the stage now. He's got a mic in his hand, and um, Pete Rock was DJing, and he turns around to Pete Rock and was like, yo, yo, Pete Rock, you, you got my shit? So Pete Rock, you know, he nods his head, yeah. So he throws on uh, Brooklyn Zoo. So. You know the intro to Brooklyn Zoo. Dun, 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 dun. So boom, as this is going on, Old Dirty, you know how Old Dirty just, he just hits that, he hits that note. Oh, 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 oh. He stayed like that for like, I don't know, it felt like 30 minutes, bro. Like, man, he was just like, oh, 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 oh. And then he just came down. I'm the one man on the A song. And the crowd went berserk. Now mind you, he wasn't on the he wasn't on fly. He, this wasn't planned. But yo, he tore the shit down. One verse, and he was done. And uh, yeah, that's my old dirty bastard story, man. But this guy, legendary, iconic. There will never be another him, man.